welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to this episode number 61 of the Free Cities podcast. Well, I'm in a new studio in well I should call it a makeshift studio at the moment Uh, we moved in yesterday and I have to say that everything is in a huge mess so you'll have to excuse me whilst I give you a very brief introduction this week so I can get back to unpacking from my 1001 boxes Today's guest will be well known to a number of you, I'm sure. His name is Mark Littlewood, and he was, at least at the time of this interview, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which I would class as the leading free market think tank in the UK. He was also formerly the Chief Press Spokesman for the Liberal Democrats, and also, once upon a time an advisor to the Conservative Party under David Cameron. Anyway, Mark also sits on the board of Big Brother Watch, which is a non-profit org fighting for the protection of privacy and civil liberties in the UK. You'll often find him on political TV shows here in the UK, or you can read his thoughts in his column for The Times, or, of course, you can look no further than this podcast today, Expect plenty of chat about libertarianism, decentralization, devolution, socialism, and I get Mark's opinions on the viability of free cities, even in London, of all places. And that was his idea, not mine. Anyway, no rest for the wicked. I'm going to get back to unpacking, and you already know the drill by now. Please. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Mark Littlewood. Sure. You, before we do that, can you can you just like t- um, sum yourself up? Blimey, I mean, that might take the whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have been the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs for nigh on 14 years. I'm now the outgoing director. My successor has been appointed, but doesn't start yet. The IEA is, I think can fairly be said, the leading free market think tank in the UK. Uh, I am myself a libertarian. um, So I'm interested in uh, not just libertarian causes, but libertarian strategies. The free city, the free city strategy I'm interested in. I mean, if it works, we're at the races. Query, can it be made to work, or is it a, a fantasy blueprint that's never going to come to pass? And uh, But I'm, I'm interested in it. I won't say that the last two days have completely persuaded me, but they've given me a lot to think about. Is that your first time you've dipped your toes in these waters, then? Yes, in, in the sense of actually being to an event. I'm here because Peter bumped into me at the Students for Liberty um, conference in Lisbon a few months ago, and... I can't even remember what I was speaking about, but he was presumably suitably impressed that he said, well, could I invite you over to come speak to this conference? Uh, I've always wanted to visit Prague until a few months ago. I'd never visited and I've now been twice in a year. So here I am. OK, but, but he obviously felt that you had some kind of... There was some kind of overlap of the Venn diagram of your life and the Free Cities life. Oh, yeah, Maybe. no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, actually, my first... I first came across the concept when I was at university 30 years ago, and I can't even remember the name of it now. I think it was called something like the Atlantis Project, and this was seasteading, and the idea was we're going to build this giant boat and create a libertarian paradise halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, nothing came of it, evidently. Or, well, if something has come of it, I'm amazed I haven't heard that something's come of it. But the, the idea is pretty inspirational. It's just a question of can it be made to happen. I think there are second best options that might uh, you might end up having to settle for, but might actually start to lead you in that direction. Okay. Well, I might, it might be an idea, a good idea to go into what you think those second best options are. Actually, before you do that, talking of seasteading, because I've 
see this is this weekend has been the weekend that I I'm I was encaptivated by seasteading. I've known about it for a long time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I I can see how much of a reality it is now because I've spoken depth to a few of the guys. Right, right. And it was a it was a nice idea until this weekend. And actually, I mean, what's George, made you believe it's plausible? A few well prototypes, right. but but more more than that, just someone laying down for me the way that maritime law allows it. Right, and right. the fact that cruise liners are a version of it already, and there is actually one cruise liner that is that has um, proper um, abodes on it. Right, right. It's called it's called uh, I forget what it's called, the World or something, which right. is actually currently sailing around the world with people living in houses or condos, not not just little, not not you know, and and also marrying that up with the fact that. Um, the technology is there. That was another thing I thought, well, what about the waves? What about this? But, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, oil rigs. Mm -hmm. Oil rigs are floating platforms that don't move How long can you kind of dock at a port for without becoming citizens of that jurisdiction? Good question. But obviously you flag yourself with a particular country. There's... People are living in boats now. People have been living in boats for a while, from catamarans up to billionaires Mm -hmm. on their Mm -hmm. sort of super yachts. A lot of them do it, live offshore. Um, but a, a, a lot of the seasteading idea is we create a, a port out right. at sea. I mean, they're talking about giant domes that basically insulate you from whatever's around there. Right, and right. they can be put anywhere. But, I mean, the point was I, I realized that um, the model, in fact, of the um, cruise liner is not that dissimilar from the sovereign... Uh, you know the sovereign sort of state model, sure. In as much as they have their own rules and regs, and the captain is pretty much a dictator yeah, on yeah, a boat, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, but anyway, um, back to back to your your what? How might we need to settle for second best? In, in, a, in a, and we're talking about land. Are we talking about land based free yes. cities now? I mean, I suppose that's where. Uh, I mean, being a bit of a land lover myself, it's more. Do we start to see? And look, I'm not promising libertarianism uh, eventuates from this, but do we start to see the sort of breakup of these big groups uh, and devolution within areas? I mean, might you see the United States of America becoming more federal again? And you know, does that get you some of the way there? And you know, I would say that there's evidence that that is happening. The United Kingdom has left the European Union. The United Kingdom itself might split into several different zones. How many different sovereign zones would we need to have before one of them was sufficiently to our taste that we could go and live there, right? Or or do we actually need to invent something new? I'm a million percent up for the invent something new idea. I'm not a guinea. I'm just saying that, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And there may be other courses of action that can be taken. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on what's unfolding in the US, but I do follow it with interest. Uh, You know, I think you could see the United States of America splitting up. You could certainly see a a return to states' rights. You you are actually seeing that with regard to the abortion debate, right? Not something that libertarians take a consistent stance on, but you you, you can now choose much more readily whether you want to live in a pro-choice or a pro-life state. Is that just the beginning of something unfolding? So will we naturally see territories having a much wider diversity of moral stances, lifestyle options, tax rates and all of the rest that you wouldn't really have to go and live on a boat under a dome? You know, you could pick whichever your favourite one of the 50 states was or your favourite one of the... 400 nations of Europe. What about the UK, though? We're both Brits, Mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the few places I kind of get the sense that would be very difficult for a free city to arise would be the UK. Maybe Sark's a a, a bit of an outlier there, but you were talking about London. Yeah. Okay, so if you you look at London, look, I don't don't want to get people too excited. I, My... I am not predicting that London will become an independent libertarian city-state anytime soon, right? That's not my prediction at all. Uh, Being now an adopted Londoner, I was born 40 miles to the west of London, but have spent most of my adult life there. Uh, I think that there are some interesting arguments about the much more radical devolution of power to London. 
uh, it might be that that power is actually exercised in a way that I'm not wholly sympathetic to, right? Uh, but it's a very, you could see it going full-blown California. Uh, but uh, it, it, London is such a different place to almost all of the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, you can imagine the United Kingdom having a bit of a sense of humour failure if it was to lose its own capital city. That's why I say it's not likely to happen. But you, I think, I was going to say almost uniquely, and that's not a thing, but extremely rarely, uh, you have in London as the capital city the commanding heights of the UK's financial services industry, uh, its political and governmental base, its media base, and its arts and culture base. And um, that raises, I think, questions of governance and appropriate regulation and all of the rest of it, which are likely to be very different to the optimal prevailing regulatory environment in Grimsby or Nottingham or Lincoln or St Ives. Um, And the, the other thing we're witnessing in the United Kingdom, London isn't an extreme outlier here, but it is an outlier, it, it, differences in political preferences, right? So London has shifted to the left. It, the Conservatives uh, have not been particularly competitive against the Labour Party in the city. It was monumentally against Brexit, I think, because it sees itself as more cosmopolitan than British. Um, uh, and it, you can therefore imagine it wanting the example I, I gave in my talk at this conference, but I've been banging on about for years. Let, let's suppose, we don't even need to suppose, it's a, it's a fact, even though I don't have the opinion polls at my fingertips, that London wants to take a more liberal approach to immigration than the rest of the United Kingdom. We want to make it easy for people to come in, um, potentially in all sorts of lines of work, from uh, cleaners to brain surgeons to computer programmers to hedge fund managers. Why would it be so difficult for London not to have its own immigration system? Now, look, I can understand people saying, well, there'd be some bleeding at the edges. You know, what, what do you actually do with a company that has some big offices that sort of straddles the London border? But it seemed to me there's no particular reason, and I'm, I'm slightly oversimplifying, but only slightly oversimplifying. In, in order to work in the United Kingdom, to all intents and purposes, you need a national insurance number. I, I don't understand why we couldn't just add a letter to the end of that national insurance number which would restrict you to the zones you could work and live in. Uh, So, for example, and I call this the L idea, you could have London being able to issue an L at the end, L for London at the end of your national insurance number, and if you got one of those to the satisfaction of the appropriate London authorities, you're good to work there, you're good to live there, uh, but you're not good to work or live in um, Surrey or Suffolk or Southampton. Um, And... This, to my mind, could detoxify some of the debates we're having at a stroke. Immigration is a very hotly contested, sometimes rather poisonous debate in British politics. But if, and again, I'm I'm exaggerating for effect, but if you could have a system where different regions could pick their own preferences, what's the problem? Um, if the good people of Suffolk don't want as many Poles and Bulgarians and whoever else in their neck of the woods. Seems to me we now have the technology to police that and to go with that grain. If London wants to become an even more cosmopolitan city, you can go with that grain. So quite a lot of the things, because the United Kingdom is such a preposterously centralised state, the the number I've seen is that to all intents and purposes... 95% of tax and spend decisions are made by Whitehall. This is the most centralised Western democracy in the world. But because you're now getting kind of a a, a polarisation of uh, politics, um, perceived destinies, preferences of the sort of society you might want to live in, that speaks to me as devolution being the solution. Now, London's the one that I've picked out because I live there. And, you know, I know it well. And it, it, it is such... Uh, an outlier in all sorts of ways. I mean, uh, 50% of the population, ethnic minority, I think about round about there, whereas that's, what, 15 or 20% typically across the UK. Uh, obviously, you know, it's got the, the, the biggest financial services hub. I don't know if it's slightly ahead or behind New York, but certainly in Europe. It's just a very different place. It's a, it's a cosmopolitan 
you know, megalopolis plonked in the middle of, of England. But let's, let's take a different view as well. Let's look at Scotland. Um, go back 20, 30, 40 years. Scotland's um, preferences, albeit only I'm only measuring these as those uh, registered in elections, not that dissimilar to England's. I mean, slightly to the centre-left rather than slightly to the centre-right. It's true that in the tail end of the Thatcher era, the Conservatives got, um, you know, eliminated. But if you were to go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s, you wouldn't look at Scotland and say these are people who are wanting to chart a completely different destiny to themselves compared to the rest of the UK. If, however, you were to look at the last 10 or 15 years, you might very well reach that conclusion. Uh, the Scottish National Party, I mean, going through a pretty low ebb at the moment, but, you know, have been the, the largest party by some margin in politics. And I think that they're more of a, a, a symptom of a feeling of wanting independence than a cause. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a reflection of disillusionment with the, with the UK and being controlled by Whitehall. And um, to the astonishment and sometimes horror of a good number of people I tend to agree with politically and philosophically, but I'm quite sympathetic to Scottish independence. If, if you want to track a different path, um, uh, let's say they want to rejoin the European Union for sake of argument or join the euro as a currency, uh, who, who's the rest of the UK to stand in their way? Now, a bit like London independence, I think, is far-fetched. Scottish independence, less so, but uh, you know, nearly happened. It wasn't too far off from happening in a referendum. The independence movement lost 55 to 45. Um, I, I'm not saying we should have a referendum every two or three years to te check the temperature. I think settled constitutional arrangements, at least for a while, are helpful. But it seems to me within the UK there are now forces pressing in, in very different directions. It's not inconceivable at the next general election that England will vote Conservative and end up with a, with a non-Conservative government. And these things start to unravel, I think, gigantic kind of constitutional infrastructures and start to narrow them down into people saying, well, I think we'd rather break away from this, really. Which is not to say it's my prediction that England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will all be wholly independent countries and different cities will break away from within them. I'm not sure it will fall that way. But that's the general trend and forces that we're witnessing. So it seems to me that by and large we're moving towards smaller units pursuing their own conception of the good life, their own destiny... Uh, which you probably can't write down perfectly in, in some philosophical document. It's more nebulous than that. Uh, but nevertheless, is you know closer to the people, um, closer to the grassroots of what people want. And the UK is not, in my view, uh, unique in this regard. Similar forces are happening in the States. I'm not predicting that the European Union is going to fall to pieces, but Euroscepticism has been on the march. It might be, and it's a slow, boring process, that a lot of these sort of cries for independence and I, I want to live in a jurisdiction which is more in tune with me begins to happen actually anyway because of these forces. There's, there's quite a few people <clears throat> in the free cities world who were relatively excited about UK leaving the EU and... There was even talk of creating new special economic zones mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, which did happen, but in a very watered down way. Um, I'm interested that you think there's a kind of undercurrent of desire for ev devolution. Um, what, what do you think? Is that, a, is that of this time, do you think? Or is that, is that always been there? Well, I mean, the, the UK has had a long and bloody history in terms of uh, uh, various different elements of it. Uh, Scotland versus England has not always been at peace. Obviously, the Northern Ireland question has, uh, has you know, been with us in its present form since 1922. Uh, I, I think you're seeing a, an uptick in general terms, not all where and, all, always and everywhere, but if you, you know, look at the, the rise, it's still pretty minuscule, of the Yorkshire Party, um, you know, arguing for not quite independence for Yorkshire, as I understand it, but substantial devolution to Yorkshire. Uh, again, I don't think they're going to win a swathe of MPs in Yorkshire. But it, it, 
in the 1980s, this would have been considered preposterous. It's now a potentially viable, albeit small, movement. I wouldn't uh, be surprised to see Cornish nationalism, for example, ri- rising up again in, in, in some way. So it's, it's a messy picture, right? It's, I, I'm not pretending there's some sort of linear um, progression on a chart and some point at which you get a crossover into which independence happens, but it seems to me that the broad aggregate of forces are sort of demanding devolution and power closer to home uh, in order to reflect the the cultural and philosophical traits of the different, uh, very different communities that exist. And I don't see any reason to believe that that process will be put into reverse. And I think it could probably only be put into reverse with astonishing levels of coercion or... Uh, the, the need for immediate, unquestionable unity in the face of a common threat or some such like. So it seems to me, I would imagine this trend will continue. And at some point, if it continues, there will be a point at which it starts to get political and constitutional concessions. What do you think are the main driving factors then? Uh, well, some of it is actually, I think, that government is trying to do too much. So... I mean, again, very broad brush approach. But if you were to go back and look at the United Kingdom it was as it was constituted in the mid-19th century, or even in the early 20th century, um, what was the famous line? A man could go about his business on a daily basis without really coming into contact with the government at all. I think government expenditure as a proportion of GDP was something like 5%, 10%, something like that. Uh, I mean, there were imperial ambitions and it enforced the rule of law, but it was fairly minimal statist in a in a technical um, uh, economic numerical term. Once the government starts to actually, uh, a centralised government starts to take much more control of your life and starts to have instructions on how your pension should be delivered, um, how housing benefits should be issued, what poverty relief schemes should exist, what the national curriculum should be in schools, what can be taught, what can't be taught, um, whether you're allowed to smoke tobacco in pubs, uh, what time of day or night or on what days can an off-licence sell you alcohol. Once this becomes the business of government, it's extremely difficult to keep every cohort on side. Um, If the United Kingdom reverted to saying, really all we're going to do is to, you know, police the borders, um, defend the realm and have some form of judicial system that will uh, arbitrate in disputes, you could probably hold the country together much more. But once you get into a situation which we're at now, in which 50%, nearly 50%, I think it's 46 or 47% of all expenditure in the UK is government expenditure, well, then people start to take an interest in whether it's being spent in a way that they approve of or disapprove of. And it's not just the money, it's the regulations that go with it. So the strictures that you know, different schools and hospitals are under on how they have to run their affairs are now sent by central, central diktat. So it's a rather negative reason, I guess, I'm pointing at there. I don't think there's been a sudden upsurge in, I don't know, Highland dancing or something that's led to sort of Scottish independence. It's been the resentment that um, even though they have a devolved parliament that huge tracts of their lives are being determined by um, a power which is so distant from them. So either that power needs to get smaller, or I think the the exacerbation of these effects will increase. It's funny, because my observation, <clears throat> whilst knowing that myself, um, I think the, the notion of the state, for many people, is so deeply ingrained in the psyche that they don't even blame the state they just see all these rules and regs and it's almost like what well, has got to be like that and and i think you know i think that i'm thinking of people i know and even myself it's taken me a while to sort of say it out loud <laughs> if you know what i mean mm-hmm. and, and it's not in the c- common parlance it's not in the common mind of, of people to say that the government are basically overstepping the line. Yeah, but it's not so much... I mean, I wish there were more people who reached my conclusion that the government was massively overstepping the line. I mean, you know, as a small-state libertarian, I don't tend to have much support around the table at London dinner parties, right? (laughs) Um, You're right. Most people are probably, even if they don't consciously advocate it, 
are renewed to a situation in which the state is automatically big. Um, but that, in my view, is exactly what I meant by that exacerbates pressures for breaking away. Because once you've accepted the state is big, um, are you pleased with what the centralised state is doing on transport? Yes or no? You know, do you think... I mean, the, we've had a controversy in the United Kingdom about this extraordinarily expensive high-speed rail line that's supposed to link up London to Birmingham and then Manchester and initially Leeds and beyond. I mean, a preposterous piece of white elephant government waste, in my humble opinion. Um, but nevertheless, a, a Whitehall-driven project, which the Prime Minister has um, effectively cancelled the, uh, any extension from Birmingham onwards. But to the to the shrieks and and screams of the likes of the mayor of Manchester and the mayor of Birmingham, and and a good number of industry groups there. I mean, I think some of it special pleading, frankly. That if you can have a train line built at taxpayers' expense that might aid your business, you might well be in favour of it. But surely the solution to this, and indeed what might exacerbate, and again, I'm not predicting independence for Birmingham or Manchester anytime soon. Was a, it was a tweet I sent out. If Birmingham and Manchester want to complete this railway line, be my guest. I'm not going to stand in your way. You can raise the money from contributors in the private sector in Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds, or you can charge a tax on Birmingham households. I'd like to give Andy Street, the mayor of Birmingham, and Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, that power. Um, and if... People of Birmingham and Manchester are aghast that this wonderful train line is no longer going to be built. Fine, raise the money for it. Now, again, I'm not saying the cancellation of HS2 will lead to a widespread independence movement. It's clearly a big state project, though. But just because the big state is ubiquitous doesn't mean that people don't have a view about what the big state should do. And if people out in the provinces, as people like me are prone to call them, uh, disagree with the decisions made in the capital... It, libertarianism is not the necessary consequence of it, but division and separate constitutional structures are. Um, and it might be a good number of people don't want to live in the sort of libertarian paradises that are uh, imagined by those who are supportive of the Free Cities Foundation. Fine, pick a so-called socialist paradise to live in. My point is simply that things will break down and that the propensity of people to simply accept what centralised government is insisting they do is, is, is falling away. And even if you want a big state, that's not to say that you want a big state that is run by far away. Do people want a big state, though? I mean, you were talking about being at a dinner party in, in London. I mean, do they know what they want, those people? Do, do they think it through? Is it, is it, is it something... That are they getting what they want, I suppose, is the question. Is that why they want it? Yeah, I mean, I think that the... I mean, I'm trying to put myself in somebody else's shoes here. You know, I remain uh, disappointed, flummoxed, angry and aggravated that free market libertarianism has not made more headway because it seems to me, not really on a cursory glance, but on a, a deep dive, it seems to me to provide many, most of the answers to the barriers to human flourishing and, and the removal of human suffering. Um, I think what people want, though, because they've just got used to the state, is they now that they don't automatically assume that there are other levers that can be pulled. Um, if you've got so used to, for example, the state running healthcare, you tend to have an opinion about how the state is running healthcare more than you have an opinion about whether the state should run healthcare. And then your concerns, if you're an upstanding citizen, and I will assume these concerns to be sincere rather than virtue signalling, would be, well, you know, healthcare is important, and uh, I, I don't just want my healthcare to be good. I'm affluent enough to be able to afford pri private healthcare. I want everybody's healthcare to be good. Uh, I want your healthcare to be good. What about who will think of the poor children and the, and the impoverished? And similarly, if you've got used to welfare being good, uh, delivered by the state and, and I take a very expansive view of welfare that you know we we will sort of won't typically have our private pension we'll pay national insurance into a supposed state pot and then we'll get uh, the money back or some form of it or perhaps more than we've paid in 
uh, when we get into our 60s and 70s. Now, again, most people would, don't ask themselves, do we think that is the most successful way of running welfare? That's a kind of meta question that classical liberals and libertarians find it hard to get people to. They just care about healthcare being good, schools being good, and uh, you know poverty being um, tackled. And then you just, and then I think there is a default to say, well, you know, can the state do more, and can we possibly you know, clip a bit more off the rich in order to make sure that the poor have, you know, slightly better education, slightly shorter queues for healthcare, um, better housing, and the rest of it. And a challenge for libertarianism is to get people, I think, to do the meta-analysis rather than the practical analysis. There are ways that these state institutions could be run better. Uh, I don't like central planning, uh, socialist central planning. I think it's almost always designed, if not to fail, then to give hugely suboptimal results. Uh, but there is suboptimal and sub-suboptimal, right? And most people are arguing in that space about a kind of technical, technocratic model for delivering state-run healthcare, and it's quite difficult to get them out of that trap. Yeah, I'm. <clears throat> it's very. Uh, I've, I've had to, recently I've had to start driving my daughter to school every day for about half an hour, and I have Radio Four on. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to listen <laughs> because every single argument on Radio Four. It, and the political hour is exactly that thing. They're arguing about the results of something and not actually diving into the reason why those things might be. And I'm not even sure if anyone does, really, apart from, say, libertarian think tanks. But who, well, who, who I, in, I mean, who in, who in the state is, 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 is wondering whether this, there isn't an alternative? Like, yeah, I wouldn't worry so much about the state. And I'm, I'm also keen to point out to you that even there is... is an important obligation upon you to drive your daughter to school. You're not obligated to listen to Radio Four on your uh, on your drive. No, but I like right. to hear. I like to hear what's going on. Not not the, uh, that I'm thinking. Wow, what this is the news. But I I do use it as a barometer to sort of find out what. But I would see, say this is where I'm. This is where I'm rather encouraged that the plethora of different media has exploded in yeah. the past 20, 30 years. I mean, the, the you know on a drive to school twenty years ago, it would have been what Radio Four or nothing, basically. Yeah. Um, you and I are sitting down doing this podcast. You know, I mean, yeah. it might be a little bit harder to switch it on in the car, but this is no, a new very, media outlet. Very easy to uh, switch on in the right, car. Well, there you go. You'll, you'll want to tell your listeners exactly how to do that. So the the ability for uh, those of libertarian uh, mindsets, or, or indeed, actually, of any uh, philosophy which has been at the margins, to now main, mainline their opinions into public debate is enormously enhanced. Barriers to entry have completely tumbled. And, you know, although I would uh, greatly welcome the end of the BBC's privileged um, financing, uh, I think the BBC should compete with other media and simply charge for its services through whichever means it chooses, a voluntary subscription model or whatever. I don't think you should be forced to pay for its broadcast. But to be honest with you, as time goes on, we libertarians only have ourselves to blame. I've got much more sympathy with libertarians who were trying to get the message out in the 1950s. Uh, now we've got our own channels and a more diverse media landscape. I mean, what, how, how many 24-7 news channels are there in the United Kingdom now? I can remember when... It, Television didn't even come on until 11 o'clock in the morning. You'd be watching this thing called CFAX or Teletext. Just, and, and morning shows were just um, programmes designed for school kids. And television would go off air on, at night and play the national anthem. The, 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 number of, the, the number of different means by which we can communicate our message now... I say our message. I mean, there's a million different messages and voices. Be it the Free Cities podcast... The IEA, my own think tank, has its own YouTube channel. And, you know, these are not unusual at all and can be put together for pence. Uh, and if we put an argument that is compelling and interesting and engages people, preferably people who don't already agree with us, you don't just want it to be an echo chamber, well, then you can change the dial enormously more easily than we could have even imagined a decade ago. What about this then for a thought? Well, I'm interested to hear your opinion because... A number of people I speak to on this podcast uh, are of the opinion that um, libertarianism would always be a minority. It doesn't matter how many people hear about it. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that most people actually don't care about freedom and uh, the free market, etc. 
Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think that's probably true. Let, let's be honest, most people don't care about politics, right? I mean, they, most people's sort of aim in life is to, you know, have a good time with their family and friends, to what, what's going on at work for them at a particular time. They'll have some deep interests, uh, either professionally or, or their hobbies. Uh, and, you know, they they make the best of whatever the prevailing world situation is in which they live and take the view that it's extremely difficult to alter that prevailing world uh, situation. And they're right. It is extremely difficult to change the uh, prevailing orthodoxy of planet Earth. There's no doubt about it. So um, the vast majority of people, even though they, you know, might have a, an idea of what's on in the news, um they're not going to be engaged in a in a political or moral crusade, and that's fine, and that's normal. I mean, I, 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 I tend to think a society in which everybody is absolutely obsessed with politics is probably a society that's not doing very well, right? I, I, I want society, I want in society individuals to be obsessed with, well, a bit like I am, the performance of Southampton Football Club. Uh, an absolute obsession for me, even more depressing than supporting the cause of libertarianism, I should add. <laughs> um, but I, 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 want, I want less politics in the world, not, not more. Uh, now, does that mean with an apathetic kind of electorate that you, you can't change things, you can't shift things, that you can't move opinions, that you can't even get a paradigm shift? No, I, I don't think that's correct, because uh, I actually think you'll find that people's revealed preferences are very different to their stated preferences, right? I mean, the classic example of this is, um, you know, how, how many Americans are trying to flee to Mexico and how many Mexicans are trying to flee to America? And you see all of these sort of bizarre studies trying to measure, you know, who are the happiest people in the world. I think if I remember correctly, I might get this slightly wrong, but it was something like... Um, was it Burma? Or Bhutan. Ma Bhutan yeah. was uh, uh, supposedly enormously happier than Sweden. And but yet, if that were true, why weren't Swedes heading to Stockholm Airport to flee the country and to go to... I think much of North Africa was considered to be happier than much of Southern Europe. Well, it's quite hard to reconcile that, those stated preferences, with the actual flow of migration. Um, which seems to be an awful lot of North Africans wanting to get to Southern Europe and very few Southern Europeans wanting to migrate to North Africa. So people will change in their own interests, if you like. Uh, the, the United States of America, I think, is in quite a state now, but has been a shining beacon of this over its um, incredibly impressive, uh, whatever it is now, sort of, you know, 200 and, what are we getting to, 250-year history. Um, people have flocked there, but people have also learned from it. So I don't think that for sort of libertarianism to start to win, that you need a libertarian candidate to win kind of every presidential election in the world and then take over the United Nations. You just need a few shining examples, which then become extraordinarily difficult for the rest of the human race to uh, reject. But even if they do, you know what? I'm not sure I might. I mean, if there are, if a vast tranche of the 7 billion, however many it is people on planet Earth, wish to live in some weird green socialist supposed paradise, I don't want to stand in their way. I just don't want to be part of that community. So I want libertarianism to be a choice, not an obligation. But I think if it really did become a choice, you'd find a very large number of people would pick it as an actual revealed preference, whatever they say in the opinion polls. What are your shining examples then? Well, say so the USA, uh, you know, historically, I think has been a, a, a pretty good example. I mean, I'm not saying it's a pure libertarian country. I would say, you know, uh, other examples in more recent time, again, they've fallen, fallen on tough times. Hong Kong, the story of Hong Kong from the uh, end of the Second World War until the last few years of effective Chinese rule, but, I mean, this is an absolutely staggering story. At the end of the Second World War, Hong Kong's per capita income is about level to that of a standard African country. It's a third world country, but it's a shanty town. Um, with, by you know, the 1990s, it has income levels that are on average 50% higher than the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, not only 
do I think you know people stand up and take notice of that? Or frankly, even if they don't, a good number of people located their business to Hong Kong or went to work in Hong Kong uh, for the rates of return. And again, although we're seeing it sadly unravel, uh, it became uh, almost the blueprint for Deng Xiaoping's reform in China. You know, well, hang on, let's just look around us. Well, Hong Kong seems to be going gangbusters. Uh, Mao Zedong's revolution doesn't seem to have worked out so well. We might have to copy a bit of that stuff. And they ended up copying quite a lot of it. Not all of it. It's not a libertarian paradise, China. My God, it isn't. But China becoming much more capitalist, uh, I think you can trace, uh, not just to you know this tiny little area of Hong Kong, but to a relatively num small number of people who brought that about, possibly one of the most influential and uh, least known people in 20th century history is John Cowperthwaite, who was the financial secretary, I think was his role to Hong Kong, essentially the chief civil servant. And I mean, I wouldn't go so far as say he was a full-blown libertarian, but he was definitely a free marketeer. And he, he fought heavily against even the collection of statistical data by the state. He was absolutely determined to impose a small state entrepreneurial model, low simple taxes and all of the rest of it. Now, obviously, you know, uh, victory has as many fathers and defeat is an orphan. But you can potentially trace the success story of Hong Kong, if not to one man, to Capofait and a few others. And you can then argue that it tilts China, at least for a generation or two, in an extraordinarily benign direction. Does it bring about global libertarianism within a couple of years? No, it does not. But, you know, there are things worth having that fall short of global libertarianism. Another example, again, not libertarian in a number of ways, but I think it's worth looking at, is Singapore. On um, indices of financial freedom, it will typically come out towards the top. It is authoritarian in a number of ways that, uh, you know, that I'm not suggesting that we should replicate. But again, it's difficult to look at what Lee Kuan Yew did in Singapore, at least economically, and say, nah, nothing to learn from that. No story at all here. Or, of course, the standout example, I mean, so boring and well-known that nobody really refers to it anymore, is from the 1950s onwards... South Korea and North Korea are about as close as you can get to two identical twins. And identical twins are usually considered to be a good way of ensuring that, you know, the experiment is fair. Well, on a, 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 a sort of political, geographical level, they're very similar. Uh, look at the story of what's happened to each. Now, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of suggesting that every, people who aren't libertarians are enthusiasts for the North Korean uh, communist model. They're not. But... Surely lessons can be drawn from this, that tilting in a South Korean direction appears to bring you prosperity and success. Tilting in a North uh, Korean direction doesn't merely deny you of those things, brings you know, deprivation, starvation and horror to the population. So these stories are, are, are out there. Those are a few, you know, are they shining examples? I don't know. They're examples. Uh, and I think we just need more of them. If you were to look to the United States of America uh, now, I'm, um, uh, I'm keen on the fact, and again, it's not a purist argument, I'm just keen on it on a practical basis, uh, that there's competition between and amongst the 50 states. And if, you're, if you were to look at what's happening in California, I would argue it's not going too well. And a price is being paid for that, that Californians either individually or as part of their businesses, are saying, with this up I won't put, the taxes are too high, the government doesn't function properly, crime is now running through the roof, I, I, I'm minded to go and relocate myself to Texas or Nevada or Colorado. Um, you know, Texas, I think, has been a pretty shining example. Florida, another one. I mean, slightly perhaps more associated with uh, a glorious place to retire than run a business, not exclusively so, but uh, these are Florida and Texas... Shining examples? Well, it's only good examples uh, relatively of how to run an, an American state. And Cal exit from California has been a consequence of the relative disparity between outcomes that two different forms of government have practiced. And I am wholly unsurprised that it's been the more market-orientated, more small state, more, if you like, libertarian model that's proved a success and the big interventionist, high tax, high spend, the government will run everything for you model that has performed worse. 
It's uh, it's interesting though because it keeps happening though. <laughs> like, what do you think? Any lessons get learned in a place like California when when this happens, or is this just some deeply human experience that never goes away and just keeps rearing its head up and down? I don't think that there are any final victories in the battle of ideas. Right? Uh, there's a great book that was written by a colleague of mine uh, at, at the IA called Socialism, the Failed Idea That Never Dies. And it's sort of, how many times do we need to try this and show that it doesn't work before we actually, you know, leave it on the shelf? Christian Nemitz, his name is, and he, he almost, uh, I'm paraphrasing somewhat, sees sort of socialism more as a kind of psychological affliction in people's minds than he sees it as a, as a, as a means of running a country. It's just sort of, and, um, and suggests that, that when socialism, a, a new sort of socialist uprising will be hailed as a great liberation and, uh, and it might even do well for a year or two. It sort of artificially boosts demand or whatever. Uh, and then it will start to unravel and then people will sort of say, well, this is down to foreign forces or bad luck. I mean, Venezuela would be classic example here if you look at how, how adored the Venezuelan socialist regime was by many in the West and then if it continues to fail it's blamed on foreign forces or the Americans imposing a trade embargo even the whole thing was falling to pieces uh, long before then and and then you attempt it again I mean that is deeply frustrating but in some ways there's a sort of I say this reluctantly there's something slightly inspiring about it. You know, these people are genuinely striving for a utopia, and if it doesn't work once, they're not just going to give up and say nothing can be done. They strive for it again. I wish they didn't strive for it through the means of socialism, but it is nevertheless an attempt. Um, I'm presuming sincerity on the uh, uh, on the part and humanity on the parts of those who wrongly support socialism. So. Yes, you need to keep winning the argument and keep winning the battle. The good news for us is, uh, in practical terms, our side always wins the battle, right? But you, you do not tend to get West Germans climbing over the wall to try and get into East Germany. You do not tend to get South Koreans risking their lives crossing the demilitarized zone into North Korea. Uh, and you have not seen, there will be some, but you have not seen vast swathes of businesses in Texas saying, uh, let's relocate to California where we can pay higher taxes and have our um, offices broken into and never get at them properly policed. So all of that trend pushes in our direction. But there's no certainty about it. Uh, but, you know, history is, was, was not set to fall this way. And what happens in the future depends on us. I think it's <clears throat> very much a symptom of the political cycle or just the, polit just poli the politics of it all. The, you know, the, the simple fact that what attracts people to politics and to be political is inherently the... the <laughs> Well, I don't want to use the word bad, but and it leads to this every single time. Yeah. You know, if you, the kind of people that end up in political power aren't necessarily the ones that you want there. And if you're a libertarian, you're more likely to just let that happen because you kind of want to live and let live. I think that is true, and there's quite a good literature on this that uh, actually, um, in, in, in this, you know, this sounds potentially catastrophic for the libertarian cause. I don't believe it is, but I think it's a problem that highly educated people tend to think, you might say arrogantly, but also subconsciously, that they can devise a plan that is good for humanity in some way. Mm. And they probably also think that they are better placed to devise that plan than somebody of average education and intelligence. And then they, they therefore go about devising that plan. I mean, this might not be an ambition to sort of take over the entirety of planet Earth. It might be something slightly more small scale. You know, how should we change the way that children are treated in schools or some such like? But they are by instinct central planners. So I agree with that broad proposition. It's not to my mind, though, that politics attracts um, you know, criminals and wastrels and, and, and people of ill intent. It's that the process brings out the worst in people. And, you know, if you were to see, my, my former chairman at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Neil Record, was always fond of, of, of pointing this out. And again, it goes to a bit of a sort of imagine the identical twins thing. And imagine one of them goes into politics possibly with the best of intentions. I want to make the world a richer, better place and do my bit and end poverty. And another, I don't know, goes into business. 
Um, and, and, you know, again, possibly the best of intentions. I want to invent products and services that improve uh, the, the, the joy and health of mankind. What you'll find, uh, in g- very general terms, uh, but I think it is fair to say, is that the person who goes into politics 20 years later will have been corrupted, will have become a less pleasant p- person, would have stabbed their friends in the back, uh, would have lied and cheated in order to get around a particular problem. And the person who's gone into business, who we are assuming starts with the same foibles and moral frailties as their identical twin brother or sister, is obliged by the market mechanism not to act in that way. Because if they act in that way, you're going to go to jail, your shareholders will throw you out as the company chairman, your customers won't trust you. So it's, it's not that politicians... Politics basically brings out the worst in people. And a competitive market basically brings out the, de- the best in people. That is not to say that there aren't crooks, crooks and shysters in the competitive market side of things. But generally, by and large those crooks and shysters are found out and punished. Whereas in politics, too high a proportion of them find that they can rise to the top. So, come on then, pick apart Titus' free private cities model then, because, you know, it's essentially apolitical. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not... uh, Is it apolitical? It's it's a contract. It is a contract, uh, I, I mean, I think that it's... I mean, I rather like the... I, I mean, not rather like, I rather... I adore the, the concept. Uh, I think it is libertarian in in, you know, in, in concept. It, it, it is a libertarian idea. It um, suggests that there isn't such a thing as a social contract, uh, or a social contract isn't worth the paper it's not written on. The only contracts that are worth things are people, contracts that are entered into voluntar- not only voluntarily, but um, explicitly. Uh, I agree with that point of view, but it's not an uncontroversial one. It's not a neutral point of view. I mean, there's a huge literature on um, by you know John Rawls and others on whether we can enter into social contracts without actually having signed a piece of paper. I don't happen to think that we can, really, or that we do. But that, that's not a neutral view. That is a piece of philosophical reasoning and ideological positioning. It's not out with that. It's a, it's a thought process. So it is a fairly libertarian project in, in that regard. I mean, in principle, I don't see why free cities... I've been interested in um, a good range of the debates that, I, uh, the, that I've heard at the, uh, the conference in Prague... But there's no reason why free cities necessarily need to be libertarian, right? They could be orthodox Christian or some such like. You could have all sorts of different things that you sign up to. But at essence, this idea that um, I am uh, my, my body and brain and my skills and my talents and my resources uh, cannot be confiscated or taken away for the real or perceived benefit of others without my express permission is a code I agree with. But we shouldn't pretend that is an uncontroversial proposition. It is a highly controversial proposition. And that proposition needs to be fought for, not assumed to be a neutral view on how humanity should organise itself. In my view, it's the right view as to how humanity should organise itself, but it's not a neutral view. It is an explicitly classical liberal or libertarian view. What would you say are the biggest pitfalls of the free private city model then? I think the biggest pitfall is can it get off the ground? And I'm, you know, I'm sorry to be... I mean, my job, actually, at the Institute of Economic Affairs is and has been to think the unthinkable, right? We're, we're, not, a, we're, we're not policy engineers who are trying to sort of trim 0.1% off the tax burden. Uh, I mean, we, we are trying to think outside the box and change the climate of opinion. And to that extent... Uh, institutes such as the IA should be fully in, immersed in these ideas on an intellectual basis. On a personal level, can it ever really happen, is my view, uh, is my worry, not, not my view, is my worry. And, you know, will any, will, will any of these enterprises get off the ground? If they do, how robust would they be? So I, I'm no expert at it, but I, I've had occasion, obviously, to look at these this effort in Honduras. And I can remember when it was first reported at the time, I hadn't heard of it, I wasn't involved in the Free Cities Foundation, but it was sort of covered in the press or 
whatever Google terms I tend to put in about, you know, update me on libertarianism today, this story came up. Two issues here. Firstly, it hasn't really got off the ground because you need the continual, stable, uh, long-standing support of a government. Uh, and the nature of governments is that they change and their loyalties change. And consequently, when it bends against you, you're in all sorts of trouble. That's what I understand as... Um, has happened here. But secondly, let's let's imagine a parallel universe where it had got off the ground rather than being stalled. What happens if the first free city is you know a success for five years, but then is invaded by its host nation? Um, you know, might that set the cause back? Now, I'm not trying to be a pessimist here. I, I, I do want us to reach for the stars and you know think the unthinkable and you know dream the dream and all of the rest of it. Um, But my two big issues are, can you really get this off the ground? Can that really happen? And I'm persuadable on that point. I'm not trying to be a curmudgeon. But it, it, it doesn't seem to me unreasonable to point out that there are a substantial number of constitutional, legal, and practical problems in, in, in getting this underway. Not that you know we shouldn't work out whether they can be tackled. And secondly, if you sort of got one of these things, a pilot scheme underway, are we confident that it would actually flourish uh, I'm very confident that a, a kind of libertarian setup would flourish, or uh, so I'm not worried about the underpinning principles. I'm more worried that, say, the host nation re- retracts on its uh, initial contractual agreements, flattens it, threatens it, um, forces it to compromise its initial constitutional standing. All of those seem to me to be risks. So uh, that, that's my rather downbeat, somewhat negative and pessimistic view. I have been quite inspired, though, to think if this could happen, if you could pilot a way through all of this, um, if you could um, uh, just find one way of setting up the first one, and if it worked, could you transform the world? So I've just penned a a newspaper article uh, for The Times in London on my thoughts on uh, on the conference in Prague. And I point out that, you know, some people might um, sort of laugh a bit or or raise a sneer that you've got what is it say 300 delegates at this conference there or thereabouts well there was only 102 passengers on the mayflower uh so there's three times as many people here and although i can't account for exactly uh what material possessions and resources those people on the mayflower had not very much the 300 people at the prague conference will have enormously more and therefore there's a chance Uh, And that chance should be encouraged, um, um, supported, uh, cross-examined in order to make it better and stronger. But if 102 people aboard the Mayflower in the 1600s can change the world, we shouldn't rule out that 300 delegates at at a conference can change the world as well with enough trial. Well, amen to that from from my perspective. On on the subject of of you know the state coming in and, and shutting things down, whilst that is a very um, real likelihood in many cases, um, I my opinion on that is it because this is a relatively fledgling sort of movement, and that has happened and is happening. What appears to happen is when it does happen, lessons are learned. The two big examples would be, in, first of all, Prospera is currently mm-hmm. now suing the government. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're watching one of those things mm-hmm. play out in real time. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it'll be interesting to see what happens because lessons will be learned for mm-hmm. sure. In seasteading, a similar thing happened. A seastead was off the coast of um, th- Thailand. Uh, Thailand came in they, even though they were outside the sort of 12 miles exclusion zone they just came in and sort of shut the thing down mm-hmm. the lesson there was you need a flag on your mm-hmm. you need a flag on your seastead mm-hmm. and now the seasteaders are getting together to classify seasteads so they can get a flag so that they can insulate themselves from this and what I like about the whole movement is it is a decentralized movement mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I'm I'm of the opinion that you know the if you it's almost like you're fighting a guerrilla war here yeah, there's a massive army trying to defeat you, but they'll probably leave with the tail between the legs in the end because there's too many people working on these projects all around the world. And Well, I'm certainly... I mean, you have the advantage on, uh, over me on the precise knowledge of the, uh, the lessons from mistakes, not necessarily failures, but I, I'm a great believer that you can learn from that, that you don't, 
you know, great inventions rarely never come off first time, right? I mean, uh, and so you know, I mean, keep, I mean, keep buggering on, as Churchill would say, well, is is the way to do it. But is, uh, you know, so I mean, fab, great, good, but I mean, what? I mean, put another way around, you know, why do this rather than double down on the New Hampshire Free State Project? Or, uh, I mean, it's sort of a wild idea I had. I wouldn't want to present this as any form of strategy. It's not the sort of thing that I've actioned, but just sort of lying in bed at night wondering about it. Why don't we get a very large number of people to move to one of the Channel Islands, uh, Jersey, say? Uh, I mean, a few thousand of us uh, would easily be able to influence an election there in Jersey. Uh, I mean, really only a few thousand. You would not need much money. Uh, you don't have to build some highly sophisticated boat to be more than 12 miles off the coast of <laughs> Thailand with some obscure flag on it. Uh, you, just need to, you just need to do that. Now, we wouldn't, we wouldn't bring about a paradise, right? Jersey, uh, although I think it has a lot to um, favour it over the United Kingdom, you know, lower taxes and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's unlikely that you could, I don't know, completely deregulate financial services or I don't know whether how strongly people might feel about, you know, Second Amendment rights to carry firearms or whatever. There, there, there would probably be limits to what you could do, but you could definitely make it an enormously more libertarian uh, province, nation, whatever you want to call it, with potentially only a few hundred people committed to doing that. I mean, you need to be careful because you wouldn't want the indigenous population to see this as some sort of invading force. But but whether it's Jersey, whether it's New Hampshire, it seems to me the hurdles here are pretty thin, actually. I mean, you, you need a measurable number of people. You can't just have six people who've designed a boat and then it's, you know, you, you'll need hundreds, thousands, possibly tens of thousands. Uh, but that's a pretty small proportion of planet Earth. And I would have thought that at least in parallel, if not as an alternative, those sort of measures should be um, pursued. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the United States of America, maybe very early days, that's sort of beginning to happen. That if you like sort of wokery and high taxes, go and live in San Francisco. You know, be my guest. Um, if you like... Um, um, open carry handguns um, and lower taxes and a more God bless America approach to the world, go and live in San Antonio. And you know, that's beginning to occur. It's not as black and white as creating a seastead or Prospero or, or you know, some actual kind of shining, on the, shining city on the hill libertarian paradise. But uh, it may be as effective. Hmm. I would say um, that that amongst all these battles won and lost, the idea that governance should be more diverse is is what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And that will, as far as I'm concerned now, keep resurfacing. That's the thing that you can't sort of like extinguish. And, and the internet is the reason why. And alternative media, which is now. And all of these things which have occurred, well, in the, you know, in the last... 30 years yeah it's given I, I, rise to the 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 idea now being <clears throat> out there yeah and, and and it'll grow i'm almost certain it will. I, I think the the interesting thing here from a kind of traditional classical liberal perspective is i agree with you that, that that's why the ideas are growing it's what makes them exciting it was it's what makes some of what we're discussing conceivable perhaps possible perhaps you know actually achievable in a, in a, in a number of years However, it raises a good number of questions that I think we've got to confront. And that is, in essence, if you've got all of this sort of freedom and new sense of community through uh, digital communications and, you know, you're friends with this group of people on Facebook and, and you know, in some ways this might reflect your value system that, and that's absolutely great. And you take a particular view, I don't know, on religion. You might be devoutly religious. You might be... Um, devoutly atheist, you might be firmly agnostic. I can see all of these communities sort of gathering together. But what's the geographical overlay of that? That's the problem. Um, and if you're going to have geographical overlay, what sort of immigration systems would then, you know, do we move into a world in which we've got 
you know, 500 completely different communities in the United Kingdom, but they all have to be armed to the teeth at the barriers because the, the, the Tim Allen community takes a very different view on the acceptability of criticising Islam to the Mark Littlewood community, which then takes a very different view in turn to Christianity or whatever, and we're potentially always at each other's throats because, um, you know, I think generally speaking, people take a, a fairly universalist view of mankind, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a neoconservative, but you know, I understand the imperative to want to intervene in areas in which, in which I see there being an injustice. Not, not just me saying, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry the barbarians choose to live there. You know, I'd be absolutely appalled about the, the way innocent civilians or kids or whatever are treated in a particular regime. So... The challenge here is how do you get the fact that we're dovetailing into our local communities and, and diverging in all sorts of different ways and probably getting deeper in those communities. I've mentioned already my kind of love for Southampton Football Club, but I, I'm in my 50s now. When I was a kid, um, probably I couldn't afford to go to too many games, but the only way I could engage in this passion, it's not an ideological passion, it's a cultural passion, was clip out the sports pages from the Sunday newspapers and put them in a scrapbook. Now, there are websites and forums and podcasts just devoted to the plight of Southampton Football Club. I'm a member of the London Saints Supporters Club, and it goes on and on and on. You know, I mean, you could, you could devote your entire life to being a Southampton fan if you had an income from some means of doing it. And that means I actually feel closer and tighter to the Southampton supporting community, if you want to call it that, than would have been imaginable 20 or 30 years ago, let alone my political preferences or ideological preferences. All of that becomes a lot more possible and is non-geographical. OK, Southampton Football Club clearly is in Southampton and has a physical stadium, but the non-geographical elements of it are now absolutely enormous. So how do we, if we're getting, making it easier for, I don't know, libertarians to cluster together, or even particular types of libertarian, you know, Rothbardian libertarians can cluster together in one corner of the room, whilst Nozickian libertarians cluster together in the other, and the Austrian school of economic theory can cluster in one sector, while the Chicagoan school clusters in another. All of those become um, possible. But I don't think we've unlocked what the geographical overlay of that can and should be. And do you actually want to geographically live in an area which is potentially a bit monochrome, right? I'm not actually sure I want to live in a block of flats in which absolutely everybody is a Southampton supporting libertarian with an unhealthy interest in 1960s science fiction. You know, I like having those interests, but I'm not totally sure I want to be surrounded entirely by people with those interests. Me, me, me neither. I'm not sold on ideological communities because you don't see them in the real world, mm -hmm. really. You, you see a city full of people doing their thing, but you can base a city on the, on the prospect of a free market and a, of a contract and of property rights. Mm -hmm. And that, that I can see going forward. I mean, the question for you, I suppose, would be, um, would you ever move to Southampton if it became <laughs> an independent state? And it, you're then, and th what's, what's unifying those people in Southampton is the desire to be in Southampton, not necessarily you'll get socialists, you'll get libertarians, you'll get conservatives, yep. hopefully. And they'll all support the football team. Well, no, that's right, that's right. So the, I mean, it, it, look, it, it's all a matter of, you know, sorry to be a boring kind of neoclassical economist, it's all a matter of trade-offs, isn't it? Um, and I do think that, the, that maybe this is a bit of a problem with it, that the, the Free Cities project to succeed is going to need very brave pioneers, right? So I know the concept is further down the line that, you know, people will I don't know, move to this place in Honduras, not because they've met, read Murray Rothbard and have been obsessed with libertarian literature for 30 years, but just because they think, wow, I've seen the, I've seen the photos of this, this looks good, wow, the tax rate is low, and, and wow, I'm, and it's got great Wi-Fi, and I'm, and I'm a graphic designer, and, and I could live in a big house there rather than a tiny matchbox in, in Hackney. Uh, I, I'm off to go and live there with, without even thinking about um, libertarianism or free markets. And, and, and most people don't. They are more transactional, right? I mean, if, I don't know, a Brit is offered a job in America, 
Um, generally speaking, the salary will be higher because America is a more productive, more affluent country. And they might look in at, well, know, what's the tax rate in America? And, you know, what sort of house could I buy in New Orleans as opposed to Southampton? And then they say, well, that trade's worth it. They haven't moved to America because they've signed up in some formal way to the American dream. They've just moved there because transactionally this looks like a, a better opportunity for their lives. Uh, that ultimately is what would require these projects to succeed, that uh, a bit like the founding fathers, while the first sort of six, eight or ten might be the true believers, after that you need countless millions who are there just to sort of live a normal life and who judge that this is the constitutional structure that they would uh, rather live under. But you're going to need a lot of brave pioneers at the outset, right? So, uh, uh, you know, you, until these... Com- it, it's almost a chicken and egg. Until these communities get established, your run-of-the-mill graphic designer from Hackney isn't going to move to them. But they won't get established until your run-of-the-mill graphic designer from Hackney uh, moves to them. Your your run-of-the-mill graphic designer from Hackney will think, well, I can move to Seattle, that's quite normal, or I could move to Hong Kong, or, you know, maybe I like the beach in Brazil. Uh, You know, this looks like, feels like a pretty colossal risk and, you know, something that's a bit odd to do. And therefore, likely, in its, at least in its early stages, to appeal to kind of hardcore libertarians rather than normal people who would like a more free market system. And I would love to see it break through that sort of early adopter point to being a kind of mass technology, if you like. And maybe it can. There's no, I'm not saying it can't, but it is a problem in delivery, I think. I wonder if... Um, people living in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s thought that people would be leaving to go to Texas. I mean, I like that analogy because it's true and it does show that people do vote with their feet mm-hmm. and they and they are doing it and we know that. We know personally and obviously a lot of famous people do it. <laughs> yeah, but my worry, my worry for the Free Cities movement is... I mean, th- those sort of things will happen and change all the time, right? And people do move and vote with their feet, and then lessons are learned, and, you know, perhaps the more failed countries take a corrective action. Um, but, you know, it, it is people from California moving to Texas. That this seems like a bigger ask, to my mind, right? Um, it, it is not... A, I mean, it's an uprooting of a life to move from San Francisco to Austin, Texas, but, I mean, it's not the craziest gamble that anybody's ever taken. Whereas to move from San Francisco to Honduras... Honduras well, yeah, I mean, it's, just a big, it's a bigger ask. It is a bigger ask. But um, I would say not only do we have a different calibre of person these days. I mean, look at digital nomads. Mm-hmm. They'll mm-hmm. literally, at the drop of a pin, go and live in Montenegro. Or yep, go yep. Into, um, and they will, they will be in their 40s one day with a family. Those, mm-hmm. those same 18 and 19 year olds so it could be but but also I, I we would expect Honduras not to be the only shining beacon sure <laughs> that you, we need, see. you need several shining cities on a hill you're saying yeah I mean the, the other thing I can't I, I, I don't speak for this just observational I don't speak from this from any point of of um expertise you know how do we think that people's living and working desires will change you mentioned youngsters you know going to Montenegro I've seen you know kids in their 20s who are working for me who will be sort of oh yeah I'm just going to you know even being to like Ukraine I mean the safer parts of it I'll just hang out there for a week or two the beer's cheap and I'll get all my work done from my laptop there I found a place with wi-fi the interesting thing is they're peripatetic right so do you think you will find these 25 year old graphic designers wanting to move to Honduras or some similar proposition or do you think you'll find that they want to go there for 10 days, have a nice holiday there, then go to Montenegro for another 10 days, then maybe, you know, head back to London to see mum and dad and, and then head out to Rio de Janeiro? Will you get, will these sort of nomads be, as, it's, as the name suggests, peripatetic? In which case, if you're appealing more to them 20 years down the line, I've now got the wife and two kids and, uh, you know, and, you know a private pension and and a car in the garage, and I've just finished the extension, and we're thinking of building a swimming pool. Well, now, getting them to move to Honduras is a bigger ask than your 25-year-old, you know, hanging out there in an Airbnb for a while. So again, I I know that, you know, teachers and others would have been studying this as a business. I've not studied it as a business in depth. But it seems to me there's a whole plethora of 
radical ways that people's um, work-life balance might change. I mean, in- increasingly, I mean, it's partly because the UK has such absurd planning laws that it then has such absurd house prices that we've priced young young people in their early career almost out of the housing market. But you can imagine a world in which people live a much more peripatetic existence, never own a home, hop from one Airbnb to another, never own a car, you know, just hire a car as and when they want to. Potentially further down the line, you know, unlike my mum and dad, don't have their finest dining set. You know, they just hire posh crockery whenever they need it for a particular dinner party. That's quite an issue, I think, for capitalism in general, actually. We might be moving to a generation in which, you know, you're, you don't have the same, you don't strive to have the same actual assets. You need to have some sort of money, possibly even Bitcoin, to allow you to hop around. But you don't have a house and a car and collect things and acquire things and have works of art on your wall. You just beam a picture of your favourite piece of art onto the wall. All of that, I think, has you know, big and fairly unpredictable consequences for anybody trying to set up a community fit for the 2050s. You will own nothing and be happy, as Klaus Schwab would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, I, I think I'm going to leave it there. This has been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for coming in, and um, good luck with your libertarian utopia, wherever that might be. And, and to yours, each to their own, but all of us has our own libertarian utopia somewhere deep inside us be good to find an actual geographical place where we could locate it to sure thanks for coming in Mm